we manufacture uh, funeral supplies. Really? Yes. yes. Well, there's a lot of death here. Have you have you <laughs> learned anything from seeing the exhibits? Oh yes, there? there's some funerary exhibits in there, and uh, particularly in the British Roman uh, part. Each of the museum's ten departments has a team of museum assistants whose job is to handle precious objects, mount them on display, and travel abroad with them, seeing them safely on and off trucks and planes. My name is Paul Martin. I'm a museum assistant in the Department of Japanese Antiquities at the British Museum. How did this job come to your life? At the time I was an electrician, and it was during the recession, 92, 93. I was with a friend of mine, and we popped into the museum to see his father, who was a security warder. And he told me of vacancies going here. I applied and joined the Japanese department almost five years ago. Tell us what it was like uh, in security. We'd have to control the unlocking and the locking of the building, the patrols during the night, patrols during the day, and various posts around the museum that have to be manned constantly. What's it like being in the museum at night? Fantastic, because it's absolutely quiet. And you have to walk through the mummies with just a torch. And it's a, a unique experience that not everyone gets to to see. Scary? No. What other um, galleries do you like walking through at night? Mm, the King's Library is very nice. There's an old wooden floor and the floor settles down during the course of the evening. And then as you walk across it, it becomes unsettled and it settles again behind you. So it sounds like there's someone walking behind you, but there isn't. <laughs> And what about outside the museum? What's that like? One of the most enjoyable aspects of working on security was mingling with the public, the interaction. And I taught myself to speak Japanese by this interaction, with Jap particularly with Japanese public, obviously. I didn't realise when I came to the museum the volume of Japanese visitors that came to the museum. And I already had a, a Japanese interest from a young boy. And it was a great opportunity to practice language and get And the Japanese people were fantastic. The response was unbelievable. Where did you develop this interest in Japan? From the age of seven, I practiced karate. My father was my first instructor. He was a news agent, and he practiced karate more or less six nights a week in the early 70s. And I wanted to be like my dad. <laughs> and I became three times English champion and represented England. So did you have your eye on the Japanese gallery when you got here? People said to me, they knew my background, they said, oh, you should join the Japanese department. I waited four and a half years <laughs> till the opportunity arose. It was kind of daunting because I don't have a degree and the general requirement for anything in the museum is to have a degree for any academic posts. I was actually quite an anomaly within the British Museum, the fact that I made the crossover from security to an academic department directly. None of the other applicants spoke Japanese. What did you say in Japanese? Konnichiwa. Hajimemashite, Paul Martin Tomoshimasu. That's introducing yourself. Can you do more complex, sophisticated conversations? Uh, yeah, if we spoke about swords, I could speak in terminology that most Japanese people don't use, but on a general day to day basis, I can get stuck. So, what was your impression when you got there? It was a dream come true. I had the opportunity to go to Japan, which I've never been able to entertain before. I'd always wanted to go to Japan, and now I've been eight times which is still quite remarkable for me. So what was it like? What was your impression of Japan? Actually, there was no surprises. It was as I expected it to be. I've watched Japanese films from around the age of 13. I know that films are generally fiction, but I was encouraged to watch Kurosawa films. A big influence on me was a film called The Yakuza with Robert Mitchum and a Japanese actor called Takakura Ken, which instantly inspired me to start Kendo, the, the Japanese way of the sword. And so each time you went on museum business, presumably, mm. what were the duties you were performing there? Uh, I'd be couriering objects and installing them at exhibitions or bringing them back. But every time I would either take annual leave in Japan and go and study swords, or practice kendo, visit museums to do with swords. Is there a holy of holy places to do with your art of swords? Swords are generally considered sacred anyway, whether they're in museums or in shrines. I've been to Atsuta Jingu, which is the main shrine in Japan, where the Kusanagi no Surugi, the imperial regalia sword from the emperor, which allegedly came down from heaven with the first emperor, is kept. What does it look like? I don't know. I haven't seen it. Why not? I felt it was impolite to ask to see it. 
when you're involved with Japanese culture, you have to go on this intuition on some of the ways you conduct yourself. Will you tell us about the components of the sword? Japanese sword is made from a product called satetsu, which is sand iron, smelted in a kiln, and all the impurities are removed until it's more or less pure. It's smelted with charcoal, so it gains in carbon content. And it's distributed to swordsmiths. They'll take the steel, they'll fold it, hammer it out into the shape of a sword, and then it's covered in a layer of clay, which is scraped off along the cutting edge. It's heated to the colour of the moon in February or August, and then plunged into water, which hardens the cutting edge of the steel. What colour is the moon in February and August? It's a kind of ready orangey colour. The, the moon sits quite low in the sky and it looks quite big and you can see this ready appearance to it. So there's something very mystical about the processes of making these swords, isn't there? Yeah, very much so. The sword is considered sacred from the moment it's started to be made. There's religious rituals that are carried out before the swordsmith even entertains making a sword to purify his workshop. The swords made just prior to the war and during the war were a bit of a mistake for the Japanese because they were sold to soldiers cheaply. They were made at standard size, so we had a lot of soldiers playing the samurai. And it was a big propaganda movement for Japan to try and boost Bushido spirit. These swords were not made in a traditional manner. Almost cost Japan their heritage in their traditionally made swords as cultural objects. During the American occupation, the Americans began confiscating all Japanese swords. Quite a few were destroyed. It was only down to two Japanese men that pleaded the case to the American army that they were actually beautiful art objects and culturally significant to the Japanese people, which actually saved the Japanese sword because sword making and any martial arts were banned during the American occupation. Shall we now look at this sword? Right, we can't speak over the sword. We can't touch the polished edges. Yeah, we may touch the tang. The tang. The tang. The handle of the sword. We don't. Obviously, we don't breathe on it. It's, it's the same as speaking over it. Paul is taking the sword out of a purple silk cloth, very, very carefully. Uchi cup, which removes any moisture that may be on the blade. No. Now I'm tapping the blade in case there's any larger parts of Uchi cup that may damage the blade when I remove the Uchi cup. How old is this sword? This sword was made in the 12th century, around the 12th century. I would never have known, it looks brand new. This is a fantastic sword. The crystalline activities that happen when the sword is plunged into the water are shown along this kind of smoky edge, along the cutting edge. There's a wood grain pattern along the whole length of the blade, which is brought about by the folding of the steel. And as you can see, the smoky kind of pattern just along the cutting edge has different activities that are caused during the quenching of the sword into the water. This is a critical time for the sword because it brings about a lot of stress in the change of temperature. So the swordsmith will pray to the gods when he's plunging the sword into the water, hoping that the sword will survive. In the back of the sword, towards the point, we have some nicks that have happened while it was being used in combat. Uh, the reason we think the sword is curved down at this end is because in the earlier warfare periods, the swords were used from horseback. In the later periods, the swords are curved nearer to the point. This is because the soldiers were fighting on foot. We display swords so that people can read the inscription that is usually on the tank. As you can see here, 
is a two character in description, Yoshikane. And what does that mean? That's the smith's name. I see. The way that the, the sword continues and the tang is part of the curve of the sword with the same thickness is a tribute to the function of the Japanese sword. With this kind of tang, you can cut a person in two. With a, a cavalry sabre, you might take off someone's arm or their head if you're lucky. But with a Japanese sword, you could cut someone from the shoulder down to the hip, completely in two. Have you felt the sharpness of the blade on this? No. Because you're not allowed to? <laughs> yeah, it's just not done. The blade is sensitive, so any touching is going to damage the blade. Because if you were out of this room, mm. I would be touching that blade. Mm. It's, <laughs> it's very tempting, I know, but it's for the greater good of the sword. As well as a very efficient cutting weapon, probably the most efficient cutting weapon in the world, it's also a religious object. It's spiritually enlightening. Swords are made and presented to shrines as vessels for the Japanese gods, the kami, or just as gifts, offerings to the gods as well. The Japanese sword is considered a guide to the samurai on how he should conduct his life. To a Zen master, the sword is not to destroy other people, but his own folly, greed and anger. And the use of the sword should use it in such a way so as to promote truth, justice, peace and humanity. It's also an art object. It's intrinsically beautiful. When you look in the hamon, this frosted edge, you can see the different activities can resemble elements of nature, like lightning, clouds. There's actually 12th century scrolls with paintings of noble men admiring their swords for the artistic qualities in them. Not long after it was made, it became revered and was probably not used much. Once it became slightly old, it was probably kept and handed down as an art object. I'm holding it by the tang. It's heavier than I thought. Really, I'm, I'm always surprised. I find this one quite buoyant, actually. But it's got a lovely balance to it. It is a thing of beauty. And... You really wouldn't want to treat this in a facetious or trivial way. It clearly is a sacred object. It catches the light as I turn it. In fact, it's the late afternoon and the sun's glinting off it. I feel myself talking in a Japanese way now. I'd like to wave it in the air in a cavalry manner, but I have a feeling that Paul might practice some of his karate on me if I did. I may not have been able to have my way with that samurai sword, but tomorrow I do get my hands on the biggest coin in the British Museum, and believe me, it's big. <laughs>